Greetings ladies and mental gents, and welcome to this daily science fiction extravaganza commonly known as Tales, Tales from Out from space. Out. Space. Out. space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. On to the science fiction. Story number one. So hopelessly naive. Written by Hale Mad Science. Ambassador KL sat in the diplomat's lounge, watching an interesting pairing across the room. Jennifer Rodent, the resident human ambassador at the Conclave, was talking to the Bartar Council Feral. Farrell's harsh, growling voice carried through the room, though Kyle had not made out the words from where he was sitting. So for now, he studied the two creatures. Kyle's people, the Sen, were more than familiar with humans, and in fact, Kyle was personally acquainted with Jennifer Rowland. His people often employed humans to transport their wares across the galaxy, so he had naturally cultivated a close relationship with their representative at the Conclave. Friendly was the best way to describe Jennifer Rowland. She thought of and treated almost everyone she encountered as if they were lifelong friends. She almost always had a human smile across her pale, flat face. Humans, generally speaking, are not wholly unusual creatures in the galaxy. They are, as a race, thoroughly average in nearly all aspects. While they may have those few who rise above the rest, most humans wouldn't be of particular interest anywhere in civilized space. Kyle shifted his attention away from the human. In contrast to Jennifer Road, Veryl, he only knew by reputation. Though the Batar were often clients of his people, Kyle knew to engage in personal negotiations with a particular member of a species, for which he was glad if the rumors were true. Bata was notorious for their high-handed, prideful ways. Physically, they were imposing to many other races, towering almost eight feet tall on average, and their physiology spoke of a species' history as terrible hunters. Though bipedal, Bata could drop and run fast upon all fours of their strongly muscled limbs if so inclined. Even their ursine faces, with their extended jaws full of sharp, meat-eating teeth and their forward-set eyes, hinted at their origins. Feral, in particular, was loud, violent, argumentative, and proud, always quick to take offense or offer insult to anyone who displeased him, or simply failed to properly please him. None of the spaced Jennifer Rowland, however. As Feral stood, towering over her barely five-foot frame, the human simply wore her normal smile and spoke in a normal voice. K.L. shook his head. Humans were so very average in almost every way. Unfortunately, as a race, they were so terribly, hopelessly naive. The human race as a whole was unable to understand the subtleties and nuances of many things. Diplomacy in particular was somewhat beyond them. It was not that humans did not comprehend such things exactly. For example, humans were capable of deception and lies. But sadly, they just lacked the knack for it. Many of their lies were easily seen through, and so few of them were capable of piercing the lies of other species. Nuances, hidden meanings in words, subtext, all things the humans had failed to master. This led many races to think of them as harmless, though Kayal knew that this wasn't true. After all, human soldiers were no worse than any other troops in the galaxy, even if they lacked the particular cunning that the greatest military minds exhibited. Pharrell stood to his full height now, looming over most of the room, many of the ambassadors familiar with his ways, simply ignoring him. But Kyle continued to watch the unusual pair. With a wordless snarl that clearly reached even his ears, Pharrell left the room in a fury, leaving Jennifer Rowland standing alone with a confused look on her face. Kyle sensed an opportunity. He stood and motioned for the human ambassador to join him. He was pleased that she did so, taking a chair near his with a friendly human smile. Ambassador Kale, it is good to see you this day. Traffic to and from the conclave has been heavy of late, has it not? Small talk, a human custom to pull silence when there was nothing of importance to discuss. 
The human seemed completely unaffected by her conversation with Bartar. How could she not be aware of the danger that had been so close? Inwardly, Gael smiled. He would have coaxed the information from the easily manipulated human then. I had not noticed Jennifer Rowland. I do not have much time to watch the docking ports these days, but I could not help but notice your interaction with Ambassador Farrell. He seemed to be an even less pleasant than normal mood, Kael remarked. The human nodded her head. Kael recognized this as a sign that she was willing to talk about the subject. Gossip, the humans called it, another strange custom, but one the Conclave had wholeheartedly embraced. The naive humans seemed unable to keep any secrets to themselves. They were always sharing things, from inane drivel to deeply held secrets to stories so outlandish that they had to have been fabricated just to mock the humans. Jennifer Rowland was no exception, always happily sharing anything she knew with those who knew how to approach her. Kael was one such. Oh yes, it's the strangest thing, you see. Just two days ago, I had lunch with Merle Delegate and we were discussing the best sites to visit in the galaxy. Kael recognized this as another type of small talk, but more importantly, the Merle and the Bata were mortal enemies, having been locked in a standoff for over a thousand years, within numerous wars and skirmishes between the two species. Kael suppressed a smile of his own. His people were preeminent weapons manufacturers in the galaxy. There wasn't an army or naval ship of note in known space that didn't carry weapons built by his people. The Barta and Merle were both good customers. I mentioned to her that it was a shame that the Merle and the Barta were always at war, since the Barta do have so many wonderful sites to visit, such as the Grand Palace of the Arhoons or the Crystal Forests of Havlon. Jennifer, Roland continued, content to talk so long as he let her. She agreed with me, but then she said that maybe she'd get a chance to see the Grand Palace anyway. When I asked her how, she said that fairly soon the Merle would likely have full access to visit the Grand Palace. Kael considered, the Grand Palace of the Arhoons was on a planet just inside Baatar space near the Merle border. No Merle was going to gain access to that planet short of an invasion. I was so excited, since obviously that meant the Barta and the Merle are set to sign formal peace treaty and normalize their relations. Kael could not stop himself. The human's words were so absurd. He started to choke on the inhaled breath. The Barta were likely to chew their own arms off then sign a peace treaty with the Merle. Human naivety would never cease to amaze him. So, when I came in, I saw Feral sitting there. I had just to stop and congratulate him on the impeding peace. Jennifer Roland explained, but he seemed confused, which made him angry. So, I explained what the Merle had said, and he just got angrier until finally he left. I guess maybe he's one of those types who prefer war to peace. Feral was undoubtedly at the very moment in contact with his people's government from his embassy. He would perceive such a statement from the Merle, a casual, matter-of-fact hint of invasion, an insult to the Barta everywhere. The Barta needed a little reason to renew the war with Merle, and Feral had the excuse to his superiors just might like. If the Merle had intended to invade, those plans would be irrelevant now. The Barta would strike first. That meant war. War was good for business. I'm sure the Pharrell will come to his senses, Jennifer Rowland. Gail lied with ease. Best not let the human know that she might have accidentally spawned an interstellar war that she could see millions die. I must take my leave, however, he continued, as I really do have much business to attend to. Jennifer Rowland smiled at him again. Of course, Ambassador Gail, have a great day. As Kael walked out of his own embassy, he was already deep in thought. His people would need to quietly contact both the Merle and the Barta with offers of weapons of all kinds. Even if the war didn't break out, both sides would arm just in case it did break out. They'd need to hire more ships, he realized, and Kael laughed. The humans would transport the weapons. They always did so happily. Luckily for the humans, they would manage to profit off the chaos that they had inadvertently created. He shook his head. The poor humans were so naive. Truly, Kael pitied them. 
humans would never enjoy the finer points of diplomacy. Elsewhere, Jennifer Rowland entered the human embassy and breathed out a large sigh of relief. The embassy's trade diplomat waved at her from his desk. I've just received an offer from the Sen. Seems that they want to hire almost 200 more ships and crews to carry goods to worlds in the around the Bartar-Burl border, he said with a broad grin. Jennifer Rowland let the first real smile of the day spread across her face. Wonderful. She turned to the communications adjutant at the desk. Send the coded missive to Seoul. They should expect to see a decrease of forces along our border with the Bartar soon. That'll take a lot of pressure off of us. Jennifer's personal adjutant met her as she entered her office. Good morning, Ambassador. Dispatch from Seoul arrived before you. We're to expect our first spy master to arrive in the next shuttle. In the meantime, our intercepts tell us that the Ambassador Farrell had little trouble convincing the Barta Imperative to prepare the first strike against the Burl. It would seem another war is set to break out. Jennifer rode and sat behind her desk, leaning back in a comfortable chair. These races are all so hopelessly naive. End of story. Story number two. A princess with billowy pants. Written by underscore underscore dash underscore 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 dash 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 underscore. Princess Beetlesheen was unfortunately named, but the royal naming tradition had had to be upheld. An unfortunate appearance ensured that she was considered, at best, a mockery of nobility by her peers. Her comically long ears akin to twin blades across that bowed under the weight of mass towards her shoulders, her height putting her a head and shorter than most of the shortest of her peers, and a heart-shaped face with dimples. Dimples, of all things, she was a complete opposite of a noble ideal. A regal, diamond-faced shape with sharp lines, tall and angular in physique, and lozenge ears with larger than the person's palm. As a final ancestral gift, her natural skin tone was a reddish shade of burnt amber. That particular coloration was more associated with peasant farmers who had been tanned and burned by the sun for decades. Whether it was from respect from the system and knowing her standing of less nobility or an innate calmness, Princess Beetlesheen took her open mockery with warm, dimpled smile of self-deprecating humor. Such was her nature and stoicism that her family peasants began to hold her in fondness, using her example as an ideal of her own hardships. Their fondness grew as Beetlesheen began to come of age, which meant taking control of various family holdings and responsibilities. Her kindness and humor was gifted to all, not just her betters. Despite her family's limited holdings, their yields began to contest several families of higher station. The subtle shift into the balance of power was corrected by the other families, and new vicious rumors spread. The eve of the noble's test was quickly approaching for Beetlesheen's generation, though it was a tradition of the campaigning season a millennia ago, wherein young nobles would lead their first campaign. It had slowly become a combination of feasts and an opportunity for noble families to show off their wealth and power. All of the noble-born would venture into the wilderness to return with a household god befitting their position. Most of these household gods consisted of lesser nobles and children of affluent merchants and artisans, whose status as a member of the honor god was highly sought after. Unless you were a lesser noble from a more impoverished family, then your options were limited. Rightfully, so far as the nobility was concerned, Lesser nobles would leave up to the two weeks earlier for going the feast itself, to recruit as best they could from peers and even workmen. Some would even dress up as peasants to fit the role, usually going over the top with uniforms to take a chance of garnering favor via comedy. Weird little Beetlesheen left a full month early. Such an unusual departure prompted more ridicule and mockery. Maybe the rumors were true. She did inspire her peasants through sexual favors and gratification. She'd have to be on her back a long while to gather a household guard, even one of just peasants. Her immediate family smiled and laughed along, having given up on Beetlesheen as an unfortunate casualty of noble politicking. 
As the recruitment phase of the noble's test was coming to a close, the various young nobles began returning with their household guard. As expected, the nobles from the richest families arrived first and had the most household guards. Some exceeded the standard count of a thousand guardsmen by two or three hundred, fielding not only musket and rifle infantry, but cavalry and lances. On the day of the final feast, Princess Beetlesheen finally returned. She entered the parade grounds on horseback at the head of only a hundred infantry. The count was truly pathetic, but drew everyone's eye. The hundred infantrymen wore Beetlesheen's family colors, but their outfits were bizarre. Billowy, light trousers of the butterscotch orange fluttered in the wind as they walked. A small jacket of periwinkle that barely reached to their waist and was left open. With grey-blue waistcoats atop their heads sat what looked like a floppy, far too light winter cap of some butterscotch orange. But their ostentatious outfits weren't what kept everyone staring slack-jawed. It was every one of the hundred infantrymen men were human. Humans in an elfin household guard. They were violent barbarians whose roughness was good enough to establish multiple kingdoms and non-states, but could never match those of elfin fame. An arrogance that persisted despite the empire adopting human tactics, strategies, and industrialization. Such was the shock of the nobility and their newfound guards that they just watched as Beetlesheen's infantry broke into groups of twenty-five and assumed positions of the parade grounds. As Beetlesheen approached the gathered nobles, someone cracked a joke about her soldiers. They might be human, but they still couldn't hold formation. How befitting of someone like her. She just smiled and offered a giggle. She hopped down, quite literally, from her horse, dressed in a similar outfit to her company. She climbed the podium, offering a proper curtsy. They're quite irregular, aren't they? She grinned. They really don't like holding the line and appreciate their elbow room. She turned to regard the regiment separate. They do stand out, even if they are so few. She turned and produced a document from her jacket. I'd like each of you to sign your consent. I'm in charge now. The laughter was riotous, complete with several nobles pouring after. I mean it, she persisted. I have a mixture of regiment at my commands. This is one company. The rest have, uh, at my order, moved in and secured your factories and other holdings. There was a moment of silence followed by indignant protests. Some mentioned that there was a regular army, an army which dwarfed her minuscule regiment. You have an army of unwilling conscripted peasants that hate you. They love me, and they treat me with more respect and reverence than you ever have. Please make your mark. That sparked even more protest and indignation. There's a combined overstrength army corps of household guards here. How do you expect to win? Marked one of the young nobles. Beetlesheen returned to regard him with a dimpled smile. You brought toy soldiers to a parade in pretty uniforms. I brought an army, an army that thinks I'm cute as a button and that I have a splendid ideas about equality and representation, she laughed. It was at that point her disturbing realization began to dawn on the nobles and their guards. Those humans had positioned themselves to surround the larger Alvin forces, and those humans had entered with fixed bayonets. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this dose of science fiction fun. I hope that you enjoyed. And if you did, please don't forget to support the author from the link down below. But if you want to support this channel, there are links as well down below for you to help with. But the easiest way would be to share this video. And if you are so inclined, subscribe as well. I will see you all in the next episode, and I hope that you all have a fantastic time until then. Cheers.